I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join us on our quest to find awe and wonder in all nature, human or wild, vast or small. A podcast in search of all that moves us beyond words. Your host for this episode is Tenery Taylor. My father got a very prestigious post in the UK at the plant breeding station. He actually published in Nature, which is for his line of work, the most prestigious journal in the world. But he decided after a few years that he wanted to go back to India and help Indians produce the kind of crops that would feed India's poor. He was really one of the major engineers of the Green Revolution in India and South Asia. She was telling me about my father and how he had gotten lost on the way to the mall. Uh, She said, I told him to call you guys to find out how to get home. And instead he stopped the car on the main road and he got out and he tried to stop cars to ask for directions. The brilliant scientist who likely saved millions of people by engineering disease-resistant wheat and millet Decades later, this same man out in the middle of a city street disoriented. Prem Jahar was an agricultural scientist from India, a man who saved untold lives when he helped reverse that country's descent into famine and starvation. This was during what today is called the Green Revolution. In this episode of Constant Wonder, we'll meet Prem Jahar through his son Sandeep, we'll hear memories of a vibrant, determined scientist in his prime, possessed of a brilliant intellect. And then the story of his decline, his brain crippled by dementia. Many families have wrestled with Alzheimer's, and every family has their story. Here's what makes this story special. Sandeep Jahar is a cardiologist, director of the Heart Failure Program at Long Island Jewish Medical Center. But even with his expertise, he was stumped by this disease, an illness that disorients the patient for sure, but also their family, even if family members are doctors. Dr. Jahar chronicled his own journey in My Father's Brain, Life in the Shadow of Alzheimer's. I just really want the book to help people, help caregivers achieve an understanding of this really dreaded disease, a disease that many people fear more than death itself. Sandeep Jahar's book celebrates his father's brilliant career. But more than that, it bears witness to a father-son bond that shaped every difficult decision Sandeep had to make as a caregiver. And caregivers from all backgrounds will recognize the tenderness and also the frustration, all wrapped up in helping a parent who needs extensive care. Hindu people fleeing what would become the country of Pakistan, fleeing in the opposite direction from east to west, Muslims also displaced from their homes, violence just about everywhere. This was the partition of India in 1947, after the dissolution of British colonial rule. The Jahar family was Hindu. Sandeep's grandfather had kept a shop, and now the extended family was without a home, on the move, and terrified. Sandeep's father Prem, who was only eight years old at the time, would many years later relate to his son what had happened. There was a lot of bloodshed, and... um, You know, he grew up with that sort of trauma where he witnessed a lot. During the upheaval, a big risk for my father and his family was that they had ohms tattooed on their hands, and they were afraid that in the religious violence, they would be identified as Hindus, you know, in Muslim areas and and be killed. Of course, Muslims were killed by Hindus as well, so the violence was really on both sides. I remember he told me about the family's priest who refused to say Allahu Akbar, which I think translates to praise God, you know, in Islam. And as a Hindu priest, he refused to say it. And my father said that his throat was slit. 
he was killed. And he said that my grandfather, my father's father, was very worried about getting out alive. He was very well respected in the community. And he had friendships with uh, Muslims as well as Hindus. And the leader of the Muslim gang or whatever you want to call it in the town where they were told my grandfather, you leave, we will protect you. No one will hurt you. And so my grandfather, uh, my father, his five siblings, my grandmother, and my father's grandmother all left by wagon, put all their uh, household belongings and made the trip to the border. By the time they made it to India, they had lost everything. With the loss of the grandfather's shop, the family fell into poverty and had to start over again in their new village in northern India. And to compound that trouble, Prem lost his father all too soon to a heart attack. He was 13 and a half. He was about to go into uh, an agricultural college. You know, the family, essentially, after the loss of the breadwinner, the sort of the patriarch of the family, the family essentially was destitute. My father actually didn't have money to buy books, so he had to borrow them. And he had to read the books under street lamps because the, there was no electricity in their tiny you know, apartment. How then, if the breadwinner is gone, how was he able to make that tuition after all? So my grandmother, uh, his mother, sold her jewelry, essentially, to pay for his tuition and at that time bribes for him to at least have a chance to sit for the entrance exams. There's a lot of um, sort of backroom dealings, you know, back then. And, and so she essentially sold whatever she had of value so she could put him through college. His older brother actually stayed behind and worked in a tiny shop to actually help my father pay the tuition and continue in his studies. And he actually became the first person in his family to go to college. Prem Jahar finished his graduate work right at the start of the Green Revolution, when new advances in genetic science began to dramatically increase crop yields. Crops could essentially become more resistant to scab and produce more food for the poor of the world. And my father was naturally inclined to go in this direction because he did grow up in poverty. And so he decided that he was going to spend his life working in science, in genetics, to improve crops. My father got a very prestigious post in the UK, in the United Kingdom, in Wales, at the plant breeding station. And he went there, took the family. He actually published in Nature, which is, at least for his line of work, the most prestigious journal in the world. But he decided after a few years that he wanted to go back to India and help Indians produce the kind of crops that would feed India's poor. He was really um, one of the, I would say, major engineers of the Green Revolution in India and South Asia in the late 60s to mid 70s when he was spending a lot of time in that part of the world. And so he went back to New Delhi, went to the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. But at the time, there was political upheaval. It was 1975 going into 1976. And uh, Indra Gandhi was the prime minister at the time. And she declared a state of emergency because of sort of internal dissent in the country and in the process jailed academics and political opponents. And so essentially the funding for my father's work in genetics dried up and he decided that we had to leave uh, so that he could continue his work. And so we actually immigrated to the uh, United States, to Kentucky of all places, in January of 1977. I'm glad you brought up Kentucky because there's a story that you tell about your father had a massive half-acre garden in Kentucky. And one day he asks you to come out there and help him with it. And I was just thinking about myself as a child or my own children. And (laughs) most American kids would not think of that as a privilege. They would be annoyed that they had to do some chores that the other kids didn't have to do. Will you tell us that story? 
when we left the United Kingdom and went to New Delhi and during the, the emergency, it was a very difficult time. And we had, you know, the sort of relative prosperity of the UK. And then we went back to India and we were living in a very small apartment with really not proper toilet facilities. My mother had to boil water for us to have baths and to drink. It was difficult. So when we moved to Kentucky, you know, all of a sudden we lived in this house with this half acre backyard. And my father, you know, a botanist, loved plants. So he planted this garden. And I was always so, you know, I, I love my father. And uh, I was always so desperate for his approval. But I was the second son. My older brother, Rajiv, his first son, he and I are very different. He was very responsible. He was the older son, and I was the middle child. And I was always sort of like craving my father's attention. And so when he would go out and water the plants, he would invite me to come along. And I was always just so happy and grateful that, that I, I could be there with him and that he had chosen me over my brother to go <laughs> and, and water the plants. It was an amazing time. He planted chilies and tomatoes and cucumbers and lettuces and potatoes and carrots and beans, green beans. And we had this bounteous harvest and my mother froze the vegetables. We had this big oak tree in the backyard with a tire swing and sort of a bucolic image. My father would sit under that tree on a lawn chair and drinking a beer after a, a hard day of tilling. And I'd be sitting there with him and our, our fingers would be caked with soil. And it just felt just so good. The fact that my grandfather, my f father's father, had died of a heart attack, that really affected my father. And by extension, it affected me. And so I was always worried that something was going to happen to him, that there was sort of this history of heart disease in our family. And my mother would exploit <laughs> if we're, for lack of a better word, that fear by saying, you know, you better do your chores or your dad will develop heart failure <laughs> you know, or something like that. So <laughs> go so, out there, go out there and yeah, help them. <laughs> so my brother and I were always like on our toes, you know, and so so I was always just fearful of losing him. And uh, that was just, he was just part of my childhood. Father and sons together, watering, planting, digging. Time for reflection, too. We were sitting there under the oak tree, and I, I remember at one point you talked about the banyan tree in India and how it's such a magnificent, huge tree that creates so much shade that things have a hard time growing under them. When I reflect now on my father, I mean, he was kind of like a banyan tree. You know, he, he was very expansive. He was highly accomplished and we were kind of trying to emerge from his shade. So the birth order is it was a real strong um, determining factor in, in your family about maybe privilege and responsibility and expectation. Absolutely. I grew up in a traditional Indian family, and the eldest son always had certain privileges, but also had a lot of responsibilities. So my brothers had the responsibility of blazing the path for his siblings and also really affirming my father's faith in him. So my father just would rely on my brother in ways he didn't rely on me. And so there was that additional responsibility that my brother had and additional pressures. But then, of course, he had certain privileges, too, that he guarded like a um, trust fund. <laughs> you know? So, so it, was a, it was a complicated you know, relationship. He and my father, to be honest, had a bit of a fractious uh, relationship because of that additional pressure and responsibility, which I didn't have. And so I could just be awed by him and all that he was doing and, and the leader that he was and the academic that he was. And that sort of awe and kinship and sense of closeness with him continued really throughout my life. But that didn't mean that Sandeep could skirt his father's expectations that his children would excel in school. When the family moved to Kentucky, Prem skipped Sandeep up from second to fourth grade. Socially, it was incredibly problematic. You know, I was this eight-year-old kid, an immigrant 
from India with a sort of half British, half Indian accent. And I was going to school in Kentucky, in Kentucky, in Kentucky, <laughs> in Kentucky of all places in the mid 1970s. So it was hard. It was very hard. But for my father, he was just a very practical man. And it was just, you know, the education. And yeah, if you can make friends and be happy at school, fine. But that's not your predominant goal, right? The goal is to get educated and move ahead in life. And he was always like that. Prem Jahar was always focused on moving ahead in life. When he came to the United States, his immigration status was helped by the fact that he was a scientist of exceptional ability, someone who had published in Nature. But things here did not go smoothly for him either. He struggled in the U.S. getting a proper job, proper recognition. He was a complicated man. He craved recognition, but he was essentially a loner which is probably not unlike a lot of people. But he was very much of an introvert, very much of a loner. He wrote more than 100 scientific papers, and the vast, vast majority of them he wrote alone with no co-author. Now, that's just really unusual today. So, But he would do his microscope work, his greenhouse work, the writing, the editing, everything on his own. He'd make his own micrographs and make his own scientific plates. Um, my brother would help him with that. I just had this tremendous respect. He was really a self-made man. So did those expectations carry over? I mean, you're a cardiologist now, although that isn't what you set out to be. Uh, your brother's a cardiologist. So were there family expectations that you would go on to be doctors or at least PhDs or something? Absolutely, yeah. My dad actually didn't want me to get a PhD because he had a PhD and, you know, he did struggle, you know, sort of um, collided with what he viewed as a racist university tenure system. So his feeling was, look, I struggled very hard as an academic, and I want you to at least have a pragmatic dimension to your education. So he encouraged my brother and me both to become doctors. My brother knew he wanted to be a doctor from the get-go. I actually rebelled, and I went to Berkeley and I remember one uh, afternoon, my father and I were having lunch, and I said, you know, I've decided I'm not going to be pre-med. I'm going to study physics instead. So that sort of gives... So <laughs> rebellion, that, rebellion. That, that sort of gives you an idea of the <laughs> twisted culture I grew up in, where rebellion was saying no to a career in medicine and then going into experimental physics. My father's favorite saying was, non-science is nonsense. And that was the spirit in which we were raised. You've painted such a beautiful picture of your father as an accomplished, very intelligent man. So take us to, he's trying to make a decision about retirement, and you start noticing some changes in his behavior. My parents were living in Fargo, North Dakota, and I would visit, I don't know, maybe twice a year, but that distance, that geographical distance, it really prevented me from really getting a true sense of where he was mentally. And my mother was not really forthcoming with a lot of details, but the first indication I got something was wrong was in 2012 when he called me up and he said, my department has decided that all scientists have to write two papers a year. And I said, okay, dad, that's, you know, he'd written, I don't know, maybe 150 papers over his career. I said, ah, you'll get it done. But he was just almost panicked. He said, I don't know. I don't want to write papers quickly. You know, I have a very good record and I don't want to produce substandard papers. I said, Dad, you'll be fine. You know, so he'd go to the lab and, and he was spending so much time in the lab. And then he'd come home and I'd say, Well, did you make progress? And he wasn't making much progress. And then he started getting touchy and forgetful. I didn't know this at the time, but he actually lost his way home from his lab. And he had worked in that lab for more than 20 years. By this point, Sandeep's mother, Raj, also began having health challenges. Sandeep's brother offered to buy them a home on Long Island. The two brothers both lived there, and they could better keep an eye on them. And their go-it-alone father began to consider the offer. When he announced that he was moving, he said, I'm moving for your mother, because my mother had Parkinson's. Mm 
Mm. Um, and she was getting worse, and she, at that point, she could barely walk. But in retrospect, now I realize he was really moving for himself too. Like he knew that something was wrong. And describe the move, because a man who writes his own papers, does all of his own research, doesn't need co-authors. You said it's kind of a really strong individualist streak in him. Uh, how did he handle the move? That seems like the kind of person who would want to, you know, be very particular about everything. But that's not the way it came off in the book, I don't think. No, no. He was very passive during the move. You know, when they arrived on Long Island, they had actually brought a friend who helped them move. She was uh, had been a friend of, of theirs for a long time and had also done you know some sort of housekeeping and, and so on for them. And she took me aside and she said, I'm really worried. And, and I thought she was talking about my mother. And she says, I'm really worried about your father. Things are sliding. There were little things like I would ask dad, you know, where do you want the television? And he said, I don't know, you know, you decide. He really had nothing to say. He was just very passive. And that was just unlike a man who had sort of prided himself on maintaining control of himself and, frankly, others throughout his life. And so we knew something was wrong, and he forgot the combination to his safe. It was just my mother's birth year. And we told him that many, many times, but he just kept forgetting. And then, like many patients who have Alzheimer's, he would tell the same story over and over again. And I would wonder, what's going on? I almost thought he was putting me on, like, don't you know you just told me the story? And honestly, as a cardiologist, I didn't know too much about dementia. I didn't know too much about cognitive impairment. And so we were just looking on and not sure what to do. I think we were a bit in denial, at least I was. And then finally, my mother one day, I took her for a little walk, helping her along, and and she was telling me about my father and how he had gotten lost on the way to the mall. Uh, this is after they had moved. And I said, oh, it's not a big deal. You know, they're new to this area. But she said, I told him to call you guys to, to find out how to get home. And instead, he stopped the car on the main road. And he got out and he tried to stop cars that were coming to ask for directions. And I said, wow, that's that's really bizarre. Why was he doing that? And, yeah. and then she stopped me and said, do you think your father has Alzheimer's? And that was the first time anyone in the family really uttered those words. Like, is it possible that he's developed dementia? It was sort of a forbidden term. It was a term that connoted a lot of social stigma and fear of eventual institutionalization and debility. So really no one in the family wanted to talk about it until my mother brought it up and said, look, we need to do something. Something is wrong. You said, I'm a cardiologist, and here I am having to tackle issues of the brain. Did you feel a sense of, I don't know, of bewilderment maybe for sure, but also kind of awe at, wow, this other organ, the brain, this is just something else? I don't think there's any other way to look at the brain except with a sense of wonder and awe, just on sort of the most fundamental level, how is it that subjective experience can come out of blood and tissue? It's just almost unfathomable, right? It's one of the enduring mysteries that perhaps may never be solved, I don't know, but what gives rise to consciousness? So. The brain is just an amazing thing. And when I was in medical school, I was very fascinated by the brain. But the difference between the brain and the heart is that the heart's a little more straightforward, but it's also, it has diseases that are more treatable, more curable. You can shock a heart out of an arrhythmia. You can open up a blood vessel, like a coronary artery, and restore blood flow with the stent. You can put in a pacemaker if the heart beats too slow. There's sort of amazing treatments we've developed. We can transplant a heart when it gets too weak or too diseased. But the brain remains a mystery. And I've, I always respected neurologists. They were sort of master diagnosticians. You know, they would figure out exactly where the lesion was in the nervous system by looking at a patient, examining a patient. But then 
they had depressingly little to offer in terms of treatment. And so that's why I went into cardiology because there were those treatments available. But I was, I was always fascinated and continue to be fascinated by the brain. Dr. Sandeep Jahar's book is titled, My Father's Brain, Life in the Shadow of Alzheimer's. The complexity of the brain as a living organ is mirrored by the emotional complexity for family members who are coping with the decline of an Alzheimer's patient. For instance, does the best treatment involve being direct and honest with the patient? Or is it okay even beneficial to lie. I'm Tenery Taylor. You're listening to Constant Wonder. Hi, this is Tenery. I want to tell you about a brand new BYU radio podcast. The show is called Kaboom. Episodes are 15 to 20 minutes, and they're immersive audio dramas that the whole family can listen to together. Each episode takes you on a new adventure. Here's a little trailer. It's happening. It's happening! It's time for Kaboom! Original audio dramas full of adventure, wonder, and sometimes even... A dragon? A robot! A zombie? It's a show made for the whole family to enjoy together that will get you saying... How about that? You can do anything. You're kind of weird, you know that? Kaboom! Season 1 is available now. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I love it. Now back to Constant Wonder. You had a situation where you have two parents in decline. Your mother recognized what's going on with your father, uh, but she had her own health challenges. I wonder if you could compare what she was going through to what he was going through. Yeah, so they both had brain disease, which is one of the tragedies in our family. She developed Parkinson's. He developed Alzheimer's. But their diseases, even though they were of the brain, were very different. Parkinson's is very often, at least in the early to middle stages, sort of motor system disease. It starts in what's called the basal ganglia, and it affects movement. But memory and your sense of yourself remains relatively intact. Alzheimer's, on the other hand, tends to start in an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which is responsible for the encoding of long-term memory. So if you have a damaged hippocampus in Alzheimer's, you can have an experience like having lunch and then it'll get wiped clean after a short period. So I would ask my dad, what'd you have for lunch? And he couldn't remember. He could remember things from way in the past, like when we lived in the United Kingdom or when we lived in India, things from my own childhood he could remember, things from his childhood. But recent events disappeared, which is sort of characteristic of Alzheimer's. So he really had more of a disease of identity or of the self. And my mother had really more a disease of movement. So they were sort of complementary. Their diseases were complementary, like they were complementary. My father was a bit of a loner. My mother was an extrovert. My father grew up in poverty. My mother grew up in a very wealthy family in New Delhi. And my father was um, you know, a bit melancholy, honestly, sort of a deep thinker and would think himself into, <laughs> in, 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 into melancholia. Whereas my mother was always upbeat and say, you know, look, we're gonna handle whatever comes our way. So, so they were very complimentary in that way and so were their diseases. And because her short-term memory was not damaged, she was more conscious of her illness than your father. Absolutely. So one of the sad things about dementia is that people lose a sense of self-awareness. They lose the sense that they have a disease because of the disease. So the disease affects areas of the brain that allow you to think in a metacognitive way, allow you to think about your thinking. The parietal and frontal lobes, for example, get damaged in Alzheimer's. They don't get damaged so much in Parkinson's disease. So my mother was always able to step outside her disease and look at it and say, 
I'm having this visual hallucination, but I know it's not real. Whereas my father developed uh, what the neurologists call anosognosia, which is a loss of a sense of self-awareness. So but that was very frustrating because he didn't know that he was impaired. I mean, he knew it at the beginning, but as his disease developed, like with many patients with, with dementia, he didn't know that he was losing his faculties. What was very frustrating is that he didn't know that he needed help. And so he would reject the help that my brother and I and my sister would provide. And you know, eventually we had to hire caregivers for my mother and then eventually for my father. And my mother was very aware that she needed the help. She would embrace the caregiver and, and work with her, but my father would always reject any help, partly out of pride, partly it was his sense of himself and partly it was his personality. But I think a large part was also that he just wasn't aware that he needed the help. Prem Jahar's confusion generated confusion in Sandeep himself. It wasn't always clear how he should react to his father's emotions, which was especially difficult in 2016 when his mother Raj died in her sleep, likely of a heart attack. Sandeep tried to gauge whether his father really understood what was going on at her cremation funeral ceremony. My father had that day this range of emotions from deep sadness to almost I don't know, a sense of pleasantry with the people who had come from really around the country to pay respect to my mother, you know, old friends, and he was greeting them. Part of it, in my mind, was, is he sufficiently grieving? Does he understand what's happened? You know, I wasn't sure what was going on. And, and a big part of my response to his illness was that I was just so confused by it for so long and I didn't really understand it. And, you know, I got to a stage where I didn't trust anything he was telling me, even when it was normal. And so that day I thought, he's, he's acting this way because of his dementia. But at the end, when my mother her coffin was being put into the crematorium, my father rushed toward the coffin to basically jump into the fire with her. They had been married for more than 50 years and he deeply loved her. And so my response was off base. He was really suffering appropriately, but I just didn't understand it at the time or really for most of that day until he made that gesture at the very end. So Sandeep Jahar did what you might expect of a doctor. He dug in. He studied this baffling disease. Now, many people are familiar with the fact that a brain with Alzheimer's is full of plaque and tangled fibers. But scientists are actually not quite sure what to make of that. Is it plaques and tangles that cause Alzheimer's? Or is it some other process that results in plaques and tangles? In other words, is there some process like inflammation or infection or something that causes brain damage and then the plaques and tangles are a consequence of the damage, but are not the cause of the damage. Essentially, we still don't know. What complicated things is that anti-amyloid, so the plaque is made of this sort of misfolded protein called amyloid. Anti-amyloid drugs really haven't worked very well. So they've been given, uh, and really up until about a year ago, every anti-amyloid drug failed. Now, the latest one that was just approved by the FDA may have resulted in some clinical benefit, but was very, very small. I would say not a game changer. So on a different note, how do social factors affect the progression of Alzheimer's? We live in a hypercognitive culture, a culture that values thought, autonomy, productivity, and people who don't have the brain power because of Alzheimer's to be productive and add to the conversation are often marginalized. And that creates this kind of what's been called a malignant social environment. And that results in loneliness. So people with dementia often get lonely because people shun them. Family members don't understand what's going on with them. And 
there are very strong associations between loneliness and worsening of Alzheimer's. For your father, was that exacerbated then when your mother died? Absolutely. So there are other studies that show that widowhood often results in loneliness and isolation. And plaques and tangles combine in this compounded effect so that loneliness accelerates mental decline of people who have incipient dementia. And it makes sense because social isolation often results in stress. Stress results in the release of stress hormones like cortisol. And we know that cortisol can cause atrophy and scarring of parts of the brain that are involved in memory, like the hippocampus. The problem is that when you're taking care of someone with dementia, with Alzheimer's, it's very hard on caregivers. And so friends and sometimes even family will start to avoid the person who has dementia and worsen their loneliness. And that actually, um, I believe, worsens the disease. Did you and your siblings find it hard to be around your father? It was tough. Um, at first, it was just a little like amusing and maybe frustrating that he would tell the same story over and over again or whatever. But as the disease progressed and the disease, it moves from in a sort of an idealized way, it, it starts in the hippocampus. But there's a very important brain structure close to the hippocampus called the amygdala, which is responsible for the processing of emotions. And so when the disease hits the, the amygdala, you can get a lot of sort of emotional outbursts, anger, very poor judgment, explosive rage. And so when that would happen, I mean, we're human, right? No one really wants to be exposed to that. We all have reserves of patience, and sometimes those reserves get expended. So yeah, that did happen. There's no question that that happened. It's one of the things when you look back, you have a lot of regret, you know, like he couldn't help it. Maybe I shouldn't have reacted this way. Maybe I should have been more patient. A lot of people go through it. And one of my the reasons why I wrote the book is to really explain not just the family dynamic, which is, I think, in many ways universal, but also the science of it so that people can understand why this is happening in a way that frankly, I didn't really understand for a lot of the time you know, my father was declining. How do you think your father's story or your, your father and mother's story would have played out differently uh, if they had stayed in India? India has changed, but still there's this sense you have a cousin down the block or you have a, a brother who lives nearby or, you know, so you have people around to help you. Multi-generational families are still very, very common. And then you have sort of often more of a sense of community. America is a little different. It's more of a sense of a nuclear family. It wasn't always this way. A hundred years ago, multi-generational families were the norm. A third of families uh, lived on farms and you had different generations. So when someone got sick, there was always people around to help them. But with urbanization, there was you know a change in the family unit. And that was in many ways a good thing. Kids could go out and blaze their own paths, but it comes at a cost. And the cost is when older people need help and there isn't anyone around to really help them. In India, there isn't really much of a social safety net. It's really family that helps people in decline. As their children were growing up, Prem and Raj Jahar told them, we'll come and live with you when we can no longer take care of ourselves. Well, they told their sons that anyway. Culturally, they were very resistant to the idea of moving in with a daughter because a daughter in their cultural conception moves to a different family and you don't rely on a son-in-law. You rely on your sons and your son's wives, <laughs> you know? And we kind of accepted it. That was just the way things were. But as things evolved and we moved away and we became more westernized, I think my parents felt like, you know what, I don't know if we can, <laughs> if we can live with the, the kids anymore. You know, they're just too different. They're just too modernized. And of course, we felt like, well, do we really want to live under the same roof with our parents? At the same time, I think my parents also didn't want that toward the end. They sort of valued their own autonomy and their own independence. 
They didn't want to be told what to do. And a lot of families go through this. The nursing homes obviously have their own problems. Most elderly people don't want to go to a nursing home. So what do we do? Speaking of nursing homes, I want to talk about this trip you took to the Netherlands because it highlights a disagreement that there has been historically in how to treat, how to deal with delusions that people with Alzheimer's are having. So you yeah. visit this nursing home in the Netherlands and you describe it in the book as like something out of the Truman Show. Yeah. Will you tell us about that? It's called the Hogewake and it's a dementia village where people with dementia live in this open community where they can wander around walk around with relative independence, but have caregivers disguised <laughs> as <laughs> shop owners or gardeners or caretakers in different capacities. And it's a lovely community in most countries and definitely in America. We value security over autonomy, right? We don't let older people walk around because we're afraid they're going to fall and break their hip. So we keep them sort of confined. But the philosophy at the Hogwake is let people walk within reason. Let them wander. They're not going to get lost because it's a closed community. There's only one entrance and one exit. Let them live in these little houses, like-minded elderly people, all of whom have dementia. But the idea is that you know you can still make choices even when you get to that state. And so they have these sort of different lifestyle homes and they have craftsmen homes for people who were carpenters or worked in small businesses. And then you have these sort of haute bourgeois homes for people who really liked the finer things. So they have these sort of different choices of houses and they put usually about six or seven people per house. And they live with a caretaker who prepares the evening meal with them and goes shopping with them and keeps them occupied and keeps them engaged. And they have like a little concert hall and they have a little cafe. So it, it's really like a village. But there's something problematic about it, which is that when people in the village say they want to go home, the caretakers will employ what's sort of known as therapeutic deception, which is, oh, you want to go home? Okay, you can wait here at a bus stop for a little while, wait for the bus. And then after a while, the person with dementia sort of forgets why they're there and they just go back to where they're, where they're staying in their house. Or they want a family member to visit and you tell them, oh, yeah, your daughter's going to come uh, tomorrow. And it struck me a, a bit like the Truman Show. It's like a movie set, you know? And so... I applaud what they're doing, but at the same time, I think that there's a trade-off between respecting a person with dementia and telling them the truth and employing therapeutic deception. You didn't want to lie to your father at first. It seems like you maybe had a change of heart about that, but you were willing to argue with him about, no, you know, today's Tuesday and that, that kind of thing. Why was that so important to you? So my siblings would employ therapeutic deception all the time. Once my dad said, uh, where's your mom? Just after my mom died. And my brother said, oh, she's on a plane flying over here. Because he didn't want to tell him for the umpteenth time she died. Because he forgot. And revisiting that trauma was just wasn't worth it. And I totally understood where my brother was coming from. But for the longest time, I resisted that. Because for me, my dad deserved to be treated with respect. And for me, a part of a respectful relationship is being truthful. And, and in some ways, I was probably in a bit of a denial because by then he really wasn't so much part of the world. And I would say, look, just tell him the truth. Like He always rejected caregivers. And when he found out that the woman who was living in his house, who was taking care of him, was actually being paid, he got really, really upset. And so my brother and sister said, just tell him she's not being paid. And I said, no, he knows that people don't work for free. So we should just tell him the truth. She's there to help you and she's going to be paid. 
but that he would react very negatively when I would tell him that. And eventually I came to understand my brother's and sister's position on that. Could you maybe just tell us how that all came to a head, that you had to change your tack on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, he kicked her out for, I don't know, the umpteenth time. And I went over to his house and I was angry that he had kicked her out again. She had an unusual allegiance to him. And so when he would kick her out, she would actually sneak back in through the garage so that she could keep an eye on him so he wouldn't hurt himself. I realized in that conversation that he was never going to accept her being there for payment. And so there got to a, be a point where I finally said, Dad, she came back. You know, She was there all along. And she came into the room and I just finally accepted that the relationship had changed and I was not going to be able to get through to him truthfully. And I said, guess what? She's agreed to stay here and work for free. And he said, oh, good, let her in. <laughs> you know, and so, <laughs> so, you know, what was it? Was it okay to lie to him? I think so. But I had a hard time getting to that point. But, you know, in the end, I think that it's probably fine. Hearing from someone like Sandeep Jahar, who even as a medical doctor was perplexed over and over again about how to best care for his father, well, it might feel oddly validating for us regular folk who wrestle with similar situations. For instance, no one wants to make that final decision on ending life support. But when family members don't exactly see eye to eye about it, more on that in just a moment. I'm Tenery Taylor visiting with Dr. Jahar about his experience with his own dad, shared in his book, My Father's Brain, Life in the Shadow of Alzheimer's. You're listening to Constant Wonder. There's this beautiful scene towards the very end of your father's life when he starts talking about his regrets. And he asks you, at this point, he's in his home, but there's a hospital bed there in his room, and he asks you to climb in the hospital bed with him. Mm -hmm. Will you tell us that story? Yeah, I mean, um, I was with him that night. Actually, there had been a problem in his bathroom. His toilet was plugged. Uh, so I went and unclogged it. By then, he was spending a lot of time in a hospital bed in his room and I was getting ready to leave and he said I want to apologize and I said what for he said I want to apologize to you for the mistakes I've made and I I still don't know what he was talking about and I said dad you don't need to apologize to me I'm not angry with you and he said well I want to apologize to you and others I said okay apologize then he said, I am very, very apologetic. That's what he said to me. And I said, I accept. And he smiled. And he was really in the latter stages of dementia at that point. And after I accepted, I said, okay, I'm going to leave now. And he said, can you come into the bed with me? And uh, I said, dad, come on. You know, it's a small bed. No, I can't. He said, please, come on. We'll make room. He tried to like scoot himself over to make room for me. I said, no, 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 look, I'll get in. And I got into the bed. And I used to put scientific papers he had written on his bedside table. So I took one of them and I showed it to him. I said, do you know what this is? And he sort of read the title and he smiled. And I said, do you know what these things are? And they were chromosomes. He had spent his whole life studying them. He said, no, I don't. I said, come on, dad, these are chromosomes. You, you spent your whole life studying this stuff. And then I showed him another picture. And I said, do you know what this is? He said, it's a wheat flower. Because he had worked on wheat genetics. I'm really one of the top people in the world who did wheat genetics. And then we just talked. And I said, do you miss research? And he said, yes, I, I miss it very much. And then he said, will you come over sometime and spend the night? And I actually had never spent the night at his house because I had my own house. And I said, sure, Dad, I'll spend the night. And then we were taking him downstairs, and he was laughing. And Harwinder, the caregiver, said, why are you laughing? He said, because he said he's going to spend the night 
my father said, he's my favorite. He was always my favorite about me. Did that surprise you? Um, not really. Not really. I think in, in many ways I was. So he, he was walking down the stairs and, and uh, he said, he's going to spend the night. And Harvinder said, why not? Of course he is. He's your son. And my father said, oh, no, he's not my son. I said, what am I then? And he said, I think you're my nephew. And uh, that it was really a few months before he died. And, and that was kind of like very, uh, very sad, very emotional for me because he was kind of losing sight of who I was. He knew he loved me. He knew there was something there, but he had forgotten our familiar relationship. Was your father the kind of dad who would tell you he loved you as you were growing up? No, I don't think he ever did, actually. I mean, I don't really remember, but I, I do remember that night because all of a sudden he said, I love you, Sanja, his nickname for me. And he said, uh, you're my favorite. <laughs> and I said, okay, dad, thank you. The directive that your father had written when he was kind of in the prime of his life about how he wanted his life to end versus the fact that maybe he was happy in his dementia. And so you really had to wrestle with that. Mm -hmm. Are you at peace with the decisions that you and your siblings made about how his life ultimately ended? Uh, yes, I am. It, it wasn't easy. There was the sense of of what do you do when someone you love has, has clearly declined, clearly diminished to a sort of shadow of the person they once were, and clearly stated a long time ago that if I ever get to this state, I don't really want to live. I don't really want to undergo you know, aggressive medical treatment. But then the person who's there the person who has dementia doesn't seem so unhappy having dementia. They're not really that aware of it. And then they still like certain things, ice cream or spending time with their caregiver or you know, spending time with their son. There was you know, a certain degree of disagreement between my siblings and, and me what were some of the disagreements that you had to struggle through? My feeling was that, look, he doesn't seem that unhappy. He's never once said, I want to die. But then there at the very end, Prem Jahar suddenly got very sick. And Sandeep's brother Rajiv argued back that their father had actually clarified at what point he would want to be allowed to die. My brother's point was, he doesn't have the mental capacity to say that. When he did have the mental capacity, he stated it clearly, you know, in black and white, in his will, and in a letter to my brother. So there was that kind of tension that I think was really the main source of disagreement. Had his father not fallen ill so quickly, Dr. Sandeep Jahar might not have been so confused about what to do. My father had a very precipitous decline at the very end. I had taken him to lunch. He was doing all right. It was a rainy day. But then maybe three days later, he couldn't get out of bed. And we didn't really know what was wrong. And you know, as a doctor, as well as a son, I searched for an explanation. Why is it that he can't get out of bed now? Um, you know, What happened? Did he develop pneumonia in the rain? Did he get a viral illness? Did he get COVID? Because that was during the pandemic. And we weren't sure, but one thing was very clear is that he stopped eating. He stopped taking in any nourishment and really any fluid. So we were faced with a decision, which is he's getting more and more dehydrated. Do we put it in an IV and put him on IV fluids? We didn't want to take him to the hospital. And so being doctors, we decided to put it in the IV while he was you know, in his bedroom. So my brother went to the hospital and got equipment, an IV and a syringes and so on, and bags of saline. And he put in that IV right there in his bedroom. 
And it was so makeshift that after he put the IV in and, and he attached it to a saline bag, we didn't have a pull to hang the saline bag. So my brother took sewing thread and he tied the, the saline bag to the ceiling fan. And that's how it dripped into my father's vein. So you could have kept that going for a long time. Right. And that was a big point of discussion is do we continue the IV or do we take the IV out? And my father was in hospice at the time and the hospice nurses really advocated eventually for stopping the IV fluid. They and my brother and my sister also felt like we were just prolonging you know, the end. We were prolonging my father's suffering. I eventually came around to their way of thinking, but for me, it was much harder. It took a long time for me to get to that point where I wanted to stop giving him any nutrition or any fluid. But uh, at the end of the day, I think we did right by him. And yeah, I'm very much at peace with what happened. We didn't maybe take care of him according to the blueprint that had been laid out when we were children. Uh, We altered the script, but in the end, I think we did do right by him. We really shared in the caring and, you know, it could have gone differently. And in some families, many families, it does go differently. But in ours, I think we were lucky that we saw things for the most part in the same way. Thank you for sharing your family's story with us. This is hard work, reliving some of these experiences. Um, What makes it worth it to you? I just want to communicate to readers and listeners that you're not alone. Many people go through this, but they stay silent. And I just thought it was important to chronicle the journey that my family went through so that readers and listeners will get some comfort or understanding or solace from another person's experience. That's really, in the end, what it's all about. Dr. Sandeep Jahar is the author of My Father's Brain, Life in the Shadow of Alzheimer's. He's also the director of the Heart Failure Program at Long Island Jewish Medical Center. I'm Tenery Taylor. This episode was produced by me with help from Marcus Smith and Jenna McMartin. Sound design by Mitchell Towsley and Kevin West. If you like what you're hearing on Constant Wonder, take a minute to give us a five-star rating or leave a review wherever you found us. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.